Open with me, if you will, to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, and verse 2. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, and verse 2. And I will begin reading in verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. There is no subject that I dislike to preach on more than giving. And especially when you must understand giving as the giving of money. There are many things that people might forgive. When you start messing with their wallets, that forgiveness gets real thin real fast. Talk about money. You seem to put yourself in the company of some men that I would not be in the company of. To talk about money, you seem to make yourself somebody who cares about money. It's a frightening position. And yet, we must talk about money. We must talk about money. We must talk about money very openly and very honestly and very much directed by the Word. For God in His Word talks about money, and He talks about money because where your treasure is, and so many of us treasure our money, there your heart will be also. And while the Lord might not think much of your puny funds, He thinks a lot about where your heart is. We talk about money not because I need more of it or I want more of it or because this church wants more of it or because there's some way that you can invest in any of this and get even more money for yourself. It's not about money that we talk about money. It's about the heart when we talk about money. Take heed to your heart as we examine the words of our Savior here. Because there is a great reward in obedience to this command, greater than any amount of money, a thing that cannot be bought by silver or gold or by all the resources in this world, a thing which is precious beyond compare, a thing of everlasting value, of the highest virtue, a thing that you want, and if you think that you don't want it, then you've never had any of it. Let me pray. Father, if I am honest, I don't want to be here and I don't want to talk about this. Lord, you know all the troubles of my heart. You know all the reasons that I would rather skip these verses and go on to prayer. You know all the discouragement that I'm feeling. You know how weak I am. Lord, in my weakness, let your strengths be perfectly evident. Because money in and of itself is not that important. But the hearts of men are of infinite value. Lord, have your way with the hearts that are here, my own and those of my brothers and sisters, and especially, Lord, if there are hearts here that are not yours, let them be taken captive even this day. For your glory and for their good, have your way. And to you be all glory and honor and dominion forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Almsgiving, or giving to the needy, giving to the poor, this was a major part of Jewish religion. It was one of the three big acts 
of Jewish religion, the other two being prayer and fasting that we shall come to as the Lord wills in the weeks following. You might think that since we're not Jewish, but Christian, that perhaps the rituals here have changed, perhaps the expectations have changed, but Jesus gives no such indication, for he says, Thus when you give to the needy. The first thing that we have to establish this morning is that there is no if. It does not say, and if you give to the needy, it says, and when you give. It's expected of us that we will give to the needy. We will give to the work of the kingdom, to the support of the poor, not just the poor who are impoverished and don't have food and shelter and the other necessities of life, but also to the downtrodden, to those who suffer and are afflicted by diseases, to those who have been abandoned by their earthly parents, those who have been left refugees by their earthly kingdoms. To all the people who are suffering in any sort of way, we are to extend the love of God. And most of all, first and foremost, to those who need the love of God delivered to them by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how can they hear that gospel unless somebody goes and preaches it to them? And how can there be a preacher unless that preacher is called and is affirmed by the church and is supported by that church and trained by that church and sent by that church? God expects us to give. And he expects us to give financially to the work of the gospel in every way. Does that mean that every one of us gives all of our money to every single cause? I, I doubt it. One of the reasons that God put together a church of multiple people is so that all together we might support the fullness of the work of the kingdom. While Jesus expects us to give money, I think he expects us to give more than money, things that are more valuable than money, for you can always get more money. But I think he also wants our time. And I think he wants our energy. And these things, we only have so much of them. And so they are even more precious. He expects us to give. He expects us to give. And there is a particular reason he expects us to give. But when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. There are some, perhaps some even in this room, though I wouldn't know. I think we've all encountered some who sound this trumpet. Commentators disagree about how we ought to take this trumpet sounding. D.A. Carson argues that this is perhaps referring to a literal trumpet that would sound when the times to give alms has happened. And what it's talking about here is that person, they hear that trumpet and they're closing up their shop and they're um, running through the streets getting to the synagogue before anybody else in a very visible way. And everybody can see how zealous they are to be giving to this offering. Arthur Pink argues that this is more like tooting your own horn. The way that me white trumpet something that we do figuratively, as in making a big production about it so that everybody knows. You're going to give a lot of money to the church, and so you go to the big check bank, and you get one of those checks that's six foot long and four feet wide, and you have the photo op. Doing whatever you can to get noticed is what it boils down to. Giving in such a way that it's more about the fact that you are giving and that people know that you're giving than it is about the gift itself. 
And so you're not really giving to the needy. That's why he calls them hypocrites. It's not about the needy. You're not serving them. They are, in fact, serving you. By giving you this opportunity to put yourself on display. It's about you. It's all about you. Who you are. How good you are. And everybody knows it. This sort of Christianity has been very prevalent in our day and age and in our place, which has been called the Bible Belt. Being at church mattered. In the one sense, we might be happy about it. That there were people that were conjoled into sitting through sermons because they needed to be there to be seen if they wanted to get political office or if they wanted their business to go well in these small towns in the south here. But Jesus doesn't seem impressed by that. It doesn't seem like he's concerned at all if those people are in the pews or not. In fact, I think we can make the case that he would prefer they not be there. Because even if they're there in body, they're not really there in spirit. I haven't gone to church, because church is all about God. They have gone to some public forum where they have erected the altar to themselves over against the altar of God. And all sorts of evil, as you might imagine, flow forth from this attitude. They give a lot of money, these people. They have to to keep up the appearances. They want to to keep up the appearances. And because they give so much money, the staff relies on them. They're basically writing the paycheck. They're keeping the lights on. They're keeping the doors open many times. And so they have a way of showing up and subtly suggesting, or perhaps not so subtly suggesting. You might want to think about the way that you're going to preach that passage this week, preacher man. You might want to Think about canceling that Sunday night service. I want to think about who you're going to nominate for this and who you're going to put in charge of that. I give a lot of money here. They act like the money is still theirs. Why wouldn't they? They've only used it to further their own ends. They haven't really given it. They displayed it. Jesus has little encouragement for these hypocrites. They do this in the synagogues and they'll do the same thing out in the streets, in the public places, on the five o'clock news, at the social gatherings. That they may be praised by others. And what happens to them? What is the result of this? Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. They'll get what they want. That is surprisingly uplifting on the surface. They get what they want. They get the prestige. They get the recognition. They get the admiration of men. Perhaps they even get the control. They get the good feeling, the warm fuzzies. But that's all they get. That's all they get. They'll never get any more than that. What seems like an affirmation of, look, if this is what you're going to put in and this is where your heart is, you'll get the desires of your heart. It seems like an uplifting word. It's actually a terrible condemnation. You're subjecting yourself to a certain kind of slavery when you do this, to a tyranny. Because the hearts of men are not like the heart of God. And the mind of man is not like the mind of God. It's very fickle. It likes to ask a particular question of those who give in this way, which is, what have you given to me lately? You better keep those checks coming. 
You better make sure that people see you often. You better not disappear for a while or stop giving because you're going to lose everything pretty quick. It'll take a while to build it back up again. You'll constantly be maintaining this. You'll constantly be in motion trying to uphold yourself in this. And someday, the money will run up, it will run out, the resources will dry up, you'll be forgotten. At best, you'll be a name on a plaque on a wall in a hallway that nobody ever uses. People wonder by sometimes and think to themselves, I wonder who he was, he must have given a lot of money. Your reward is fleeting and always in peril. There's got to be something better than this. There is, but it requires a different heart. But, and this is a great and glorious but here, for this but announces that there is now a new possibility, that there is something better available, that there is a higher level you can go to, that there is a better reward that you can achieve. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that your giving may be in secret. Now that does not mean that you have got to show up here in your trench coat and fedora with your dark, dark sunglasses and slip an envelope of cash with no traceability into the offering plate in the dark while no one's looking. In fact, if you were to undergo that process of secrecy, you would be just as bad as the person that we talked about who's sounding trumpets and making a big scene. She's made a big scene in a different way. You're just a little bit more clever. You read a few verses ahead and you went, hey, it's not going to look good if I make a big production, but if I make a big production about not making a big production, that'll look good. Jesus is not telling you to sneak around. How can you say that, Pastor? Because that's what, that's what it says. Well, because I have examples of giving that Jesus approves. I have an example of a widow who shows up and she gives her last mite. It's like a penny to us, maybe even less. And she slips it in the offering plate and Jesus is standing there watching the whole time with his disciples and he even draws attention to it and says, Hey, you twelve... Did you see that? Did you see what she just gave? Did you see her giving? You can go to the book of Acts. When Barnabas shows up, the first thing that Barnabas does is he sells a piece of property and he gives the money to the church and everybody knows about it. Even we know about it. Some 2,000 years later, across the world, we know that Barnabas gave the church a lot of money. And he's not condemned for it. He's lifted up for it. It's not about being secret. It's about that it's not a big deal. It's not a big production either way. It's just something that you do. You're not worried about who sees you. You're not worried about who doesn't see you. You're just giving the gift. And the only person that needs to see it is your father. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. The only person that you're concerned about when you put that money in the offering plate, it's not you, it's not me, it's not this whole congregation, it's not even the people that the money is going to. Although we ought to hold this church accountable for that, and everybody ought to be held to account for that, the money is used rightly. 
But the concern is God. It is God. It is that the gospel ministry goes on. It is that the love of God is shown to people throughout the world. It's that the work of God in the church continues. It's that the glory of God is magnified. It's all about God. And so the operative word in these verses is your Father. Your Father. Jesus expects you to give. He expects you to give because you have become a son of the Father. You have become a subject of the King. You have become a part of something greater than yourself and you have been an, given an opportunity to invest yourself fully in that glorious reality. And that in itself is a compelling reason to give and to give generously, to give abundantly, and not just of our money, but also of our more precious resources of time and energy. Because what we have here is not simply a command. God is not trying to reach in your back pocket and take your wallet away from you. God is standing before you and saying, give me your wallet and see what I'll do with it. He's saying, give me your wallet so that I can give you something better than your wallet. He's saying, give me your time so that I can redeem your time for something better. Give me your energy so that I can give you a good return on your energy. Come and be a part of what I am doing. He is not demanding something of you. He is offering something to you. Hear me good on this. God doesn't need your money. God does not need your money. He does not want your money because he needs your money. He wants your money because you need to give him your money. God doesn't need anything. As Paul says in Acts 17, he is not like something that we made with our own hands that requires us to serve him as though he needed anything. He was just fine in eternity past. When there was nothing else, he'll be just fine without us. And because God doesn't need anything, this church doesn't need it. I believe that. I'm not up here talking about this because I'm worried about where my next paycheck is coming from. Believe me, I am not in this for the money. There's not enough money on the world to pay even one person to do this job. If I could, I'd do it for free. Because that's what God asked me to give. My whole life. At the end of the day, that's what He's asked you for. Not because he needs any of us. He doesn't need me. He could have anybody behind this pulpit today. He could have John MacArthur or John Piper here. Wouldn't that be great? He gives us an opportunity to take this money that's worthless. What do you mean it's worthless? I can go to the store and buy milk and eggs and bread and make French toast when the power is out. What do you mean it's worthless? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it's worthless. It's all going to burn. He's giving you a chance to take it and invest in something everlasting. When we get to the end of this chapter, he'll talk about it. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, because all the stuff here in this world, it is fleeting, it is insecure. Things of the kingdom, they are secure. This reward that it talks about is something far more precious than we would like to think. This reward is that we get closer to God. We get the good pleasure of God. We build our relationship with God. We invest ourselves and become more and more realized citizens of the kingdom. We actualize what is already actual. We make it more real and pressing to us when we do these things. 
That's the reward. Is there an eschatological reward? I think so. I think Jesus will talk about it in a few verses. But it's not just an eschatological reward. It's right here, right now, when you give these things, when you pray, when you fast, when you come to church, when you do the things that God has given you to do, when you walk in those good works that he has prepared before you, you walk closer to him. You get more of him. Not in the sense that you have merited grace. That is one interpretation of this that we might think sounds really good that when we give this stuff we earn ourselves so many grace points and we get more grace added to us. That's not what happens. You don't earn grace. You don't earn saving grace and you don't earn any more grace when you have saving grace. When the grace of God is given to you you'll get all the grace of God right then, right there. When you do these things what happens is that you become more aware of that grace. You don't become... Somebody who has faith, but you become even more full of faith. You realize the grace that is already there. You become more aware of it, I think. And then there are those who will say that this reward is simply more money, more things on earth. And if that's the case, then what's the point? If that's all we're after, why do we have verses 3 and 4? Why didn't we just stop in verse 2? Because we're no different than that person sounding their trumpet and doing it for the glory of men. This is not, and hear me good on this, sow your seed of however much money and reap twofold when the time comes. That is not in the Bible anywhere. Why would that be in the Bible? As that great theologian, Shai Lin, asked so well in his song, False Teachers, why is the Lord going to give you the very thing he says, the love of which will ruin your soul? God is not that stupid. Why would you think that he is? And why would you so nigh blasphemously say of your good father that he is so cheap in his rewards? Why do you sell him so short? Why do we want to sell him so short? Why do we want to settle for so much less than is on offer? When we begin to ask those questions, I think we are led to ask again the question at the heart of this verse, which is, why don't we give to God? Why isn't God at the center of our giving? Why are we concerned about what men think? Why are we concerned about the value of money, about the value of our time, or about the value. Is not the value of our Lord, the value of God far exceeding these things, or not the things of heaven more precious than the things of earth? Why do we esteem God so little that we're willing to give him a show, that we're willing to give him a little display here and there, that we'll give him this much and no more, that suddenly when it comes to our cash, we get a tight fist around it and go, you can have this and that and the other thing, but you keep your hand off of my money, God. Could it be that we have forgotten the cross? Could it be that we have forgotten the glorious truth of Philippians 2? That our Lord and Savior, who was equal to God, did not think an equality with God a thing to be grasped. In other words, all the riches of heaven, the glories that we cannot begin to imagine, someday we shall see. All of this he put aside to come to earth to humble himself, 
being found in the form of not a great king, not a rich man in the world, not somebody who led a great and glorious and easy life right at the middle of the attention of all of human history, but he came in the form of a servant, the son of a working class man who lived in a backwater town of a backwater region of a backwater province whose heritage was well and truly obscured. The greatness of that house of David had faded to the extreme. He had no appearance that we should consider him. He was not dressed in finery. In fact, even as he was a child, he became a refugee, being chased out of his own country and having to go into Egypt for a time. So that the prophecy could be fulfilled out of Egypt, I called my son. And being found in the form of this servant, that wasn't even enough. He humbled himself yet further. He went lower still to die. And not to die an easy death, not to die some noble death like Socrates with his hemlock, not to die quietly in the night, not to die in glorious battle, but to die humiliated, ridden with pain on the cross, to be buried. So that even his own disciples despaired. What didn't he give? What did he hold back? What more was there? And then he rose again. And in rising again, he got up under us so that as the first of the new creation, the first fruit, the new and better Adam, we could come into him and be made new. And our trajectory could be changed from damnation unto glory. And now the Spirit of God dwells in us as each one of us is a temple. And we have no great high priest, but God the Son himself. We have direct access to the Father. We walk into the Holy of Holies every day like it was nothing. We've done it at least three times in this service. We're going to do it another two times before we're done, I think. We could do it right now. We read His very words. We have His love ministered between us. All this and more... His riches poured out upon us, wretched and impoverished souls. Not because there's any merit, not because we could earn it. He just gave it. Unmerited favor. That's amazing grace. And if we know that, if we have received that, if we believe that today, if we have taken that grace by faith and we are saved, it is not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, how can we then turn around and withhold anything from Him or seek to do anything for the glory of man and rather than the glory of God? And if our Father has been so good to us as this, then how shall we doubt that whatever He will give us when we forego all other considerations to seek first His righteousness and His kingdom, that the reward we receive will be far, far better than anything else on offer. I think the only answer is that we are very foolish. I think the only answer is that we are very foolish. As the Bible tells us, if any of us lack wisdom, we ought to ask God for it and he will grant it to us. Let us ask the Lord would make us wise with our resources. So that we would give the glory of God only caring that God knows it and knowing that he does and trusting that we have a reward greater than any other reward we could ever hope for. Let us pray. Father, we come into this world 
born into the sin of our forefather Adam and our foremother Eve, seeking first our own way and our own righteousness, trying to hold everything in orbit around ourselves. We esteem the things that we can see and understand, the lesser things. Lord, we are fools, for we exchange your glories for rags. We throw out the bread of life to scrape away at crumbs. And we throw out the living water so that we can drink our own filth. Lord, grant us wisdom to see what's an eternal perspective, to understand what these dollar bills and these nickels and dimes, what this balance in the bank and this line of credit on this card really are worth. Lord, let us give not because we want to be found righteous by those who do not know what righteousness is. Let us not give because we want to feel good about ourselves, but let us give because you give us the opportunity. And we want to be a part of what you're doing because we love you because you are our Father, and we would be above all and before all your children. Father, I cannot understand why you would adopt me or any of us, and I cannot thank you enough. You have. There is nothing that I could give that would equal what you have given. And even as I give, you give back more abundance. Lord, help us to see it rightly. Thank you. Thank you for giving us this chance to give. Let it all be to your glory. Let it all accomplish your purpose. In our lives and in the world, as in heaven, in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.